Hi folks, we welcome you to the Brooke McCraw Show here on the Belmont Abbey Sports Network, a, a, a bi-weekly look at Coach McCraw and the Belmont Abbey College softball program. Coach, thank you so much for being here with this half hour show that we're going to incorporate into the season, talking about the softball team here in 2016. Coach, the first question that I wanted to ask you is you had the opportunity on opening day to get out here and take on Wingate in a, in a doubleheader inside Crusaders Field. And you'd had some weather conditions that caused a postponement of the Newberry uh, matchups. How did it feel to finally have the weather cooperate to the point to where you were able to get on the field and actually play against another club? It felt great. It was a, an amazing turnout for us for an opening home, home game. Um, I think that was our first time actually winning our opener as well since I've been here. So it was great to get out there and actually compete against a different team other than ourselves. And um, ball, we only faced travel ball teams. So we really sure. weren't competing against big ball clubs. So it was great to get those uh, that sweep against Wingate. Well, now, you talk about all of the preparation that might have gone into what opening day ultimately looked like. For those that aren't familiar with what a work program looks like from a college standpoint, the ladies come in to the fall semester, and, and unlike what a lot of people think, they're not, they're not basically spending all of their time in the classroom and never getting on the field. Between the weight regimen, the conditioning drills, and everything that they're doing in the batting cages, on the infield, what have you, it's an exhaustive schedule. Kind of give the folks that are tuning in today an idea of what that looks like in the fall leading up to a season. Well, basically, we, we get them moved in um, the first week. We give them in the classroom just to get acclimated with, especially with the freshmen, with time management. We have team, we, uh, team meetings and kind of get them a grasp as to what our expectations are here at the Abbey and with my program. Um, after that, we, we go into individuals for, this year we went for a month. Um, individuals, we were working with them. The hardest thing is hitting. And so we, we worked with them weekly on their hitting mechanics, and we also had pitching um, routines as well thrown in there. Once we hit our fall season, that triggers our 20 hours a week. So we're in the weight room, conditioning, and also on the field as a team now for 20 hours a week. And that is a Monday through Saturday regimen. Um, Sundays are our days off. Um, so. I mean, they are, like you said, it's, it's a job. It is a full-time job. No doubt. I, now, with you having exhaustive experience at virtually every level of college and professional softball, was there anything in particular that you wanted to incorporate into this year's club that maybe hadn't been incorporated in previous years, or even something that you used from your own personal experience as a player that you incorporated into this season? I definitely take some drills that from um, my previous collegiate at Long Beach State from Pete Manorino and Kim Souter. Um, we utilize the run throw catch drill. I love that at Long Beach State. We utilize it here. It's the basics of learning to throw on the run and to lead your um, your defender while catching the ball on the run as well. So that that's huge in the fall that we do and just communication drills. From the pro level, I definitely am fi uh, fine tuning their hitting mechanics and a lot of aggressive base running. We're working on that. It's just certain things that I, I guess I take advantage that they were taught in high school and travel ball and they weren't necessarily they didn't learn it or grasp it, so we're, we're definitely taking a step back learning those basics in the fall so that when the spring comes we're not having to go backwards again. Sure. Well now, we, we finally get to opening day, and I would imagine that emotionally the club's just ready to get out and just get after it. However, you have to take a slightly different tact because you can't necessarily allow yourself to get wrapped up into the emotion of the moment, much like the players are able to. What does your day look like when it comes to opening day as far as getting your, your lineup card prepared, making sure that everything on the field is ready to go, and just making sure that once the first pitch is thrown, you can then get to a place of relaxation where you get locked in to every single pitch, every single play? Well, Keith Trauman, I'm blessed with because he takes sure. care of the field absolutely the entire morning of game day. So I never even stepped foot on the field 
until I'm down there ready for the actual game. Okay. So that I am blessed with, um, unless there's a huge rain and then we're all working, it's all hands sure. on deck. But typically the night before I am running through my mind, writing down all different aspects of lineups that I'm preparing for, um, especially now with some freshman pitchers that we have that hit right. and are starters like Laura Williams. So we have to fit, uh, be able to finagle our lineups with her in the lineup um, being able to hit for herself and trying to figure out how to how to utilize all the offensive player, the defensive player, right. and the flex. So I'm definitely running through different things. Um, once I get here to the school, I'm in the office for a couple hours by myself. And then Keith comes up, we talk about different routines that we're talking about. We get our game plan as our pitchers so there's no discussion once it comes into the game. And that's what we kind of do. And then once we go down in the field, we're, we're able to enjoy the same emotional aspects that our athletes are and, and kind of enjoy the moment with them where that's able, when we're able to take that deep breath. Well, now I want to go ahead and turn your attention toward the actual first game. The first game against Wingate, it was a game that you actually won 7-1. to one. And you had Sammy Jacobs going inside the circle for you in, in the opener. And... Immediately Wingate comes out and gets a run on the board and, and I've, I've heard various and sundry coaches saying sometimes it's just enough to get through the first inning so that the jitters are out of the way. So to only have one run scored in the top of the first inning is not necessarily a big hurdle for your club to overcome. After that first frame was over with, where did your mind take you? How did you feel like things were going to work out in, in the course of the afternoon? Well, that first run definitely was first time, first inning jitters. Um, you can tell, I know Catherine Starnes, my starting catcher right now, She, I went up and talked to her and said, are you nervous? And she goes, I'm not anymore. So that was one of the ones that got away from her and they were able to advance and score on her. Um, same with Sammy J. She was able to, I think, through a couple walks or a lot of balls that inning to draw the walk and advance the runners into a scoring position. So I wasn't too nervous at all with that one run scored. Um, once we went through the first lineup with us, I was definitely co uh, confident that we were gonna win that game because I think the first four hitters, we all were making solid contact and they were, what was it? Z, Brooke, Sloan, and Jenna Reisenhower were the definite ringleaders of sure. the first inning. And the following innings to come, I think those were, they were all two for four or something like that with their at-bats that game, and they were definitely hard to beat. Well, your top four in the order in that 7-1 to one win, taking a look at the numbers, had nine hits amongst them. Right. Certainly, Brooke Pegram led the way with the three knocks on in the opening game. Getting the top of the order uh, to be that productive probably had a bit of a calming effect on Sammy because as you can tell they scored the one run in the first and then she basically threw a three hitter the rest, the of, the rest way. of the way and when the Crusaders were finally able to break through for a couple runs in the third inning it's still a tight ball game but right. you've got to be feeling going into the middle innings okay it's just a matter of time before we break through with another crooked number and Sammy's going to continue to deal I'm in a pretty good place where we are with this opening game. I definitely felt that all the way through. Just because the quality at bats each of the girls were taking, they were seeing the ball really well. They had that swag of cockiness um, enough to get through this game. And it was great to see. Uh, it was a lot of the returners were in the lineup this game to give that confidence behind Sammy as well. Well, in taking a look at the box score later on, scoring two runs in the fifth, three runs in the sixth, really creating the distance that you needed to go ahead and get that that opening game win, having a 7-1 lead going to the top of the seventh. How difficult is it? Now, I know Sammy has been on the, in the circle for a long time. She's very seasoned. She's, she, she understands the, the moment as it occurs. How easy is it, however, for a kid at the college level to lose focus with a big lead knowing that you've just got three outs to go, how much of a fight is it for an individual to just stay on task and make sure that they lock down the final three outs and get that opening win? I'd have to have, I would have to say it's probably fairly simple for the typical athlete, 
But I'd have to also say with the collegiate athlete that we're all dealing with here at the D1 or the, even the D2 level, it would take a lot for them to lose that kind of focus. Um, I think the, mo the most lost focus that you'll see is if they continue to walk and they're not able to get out of that inning, not necessarily going out and saying, well, I have runs to give up. I'm not going to really focus in right now. Well, now, and, and you mentioned something in that regard. Would it be a situation where if Sammy were to have gone out in the seventh inning and given up a solo home run to lead off the seventh inning, would that have been something that would have given you more concern than had she gone up and walked the leadoff batter on four straight? What, where, what would you have Sammy rather done in a situation of that nature to let you know that she's still locked in? I think the home run. Okay. I think so, just because um, Sammy, it's very rare for her to walk. So if she's um, off, I would say that she's going to be walking um, hitters. Whereas if she throws a good pitch and that hitter obviously gets a hang of it, hats off to the hitter. She gets that solo home run. We're still up seven to two, and that's going to get her more focused and um, after it to get the next hitter. One final question I definitely wanted to ask you about this particular opener that you played against Wingate. We talked about the first four hitters and the nine hits that they were able to acquire in, in the opening game. How important is it for the long-term vitality of the offense? You, you've, got their, you've got those four names in the lineup for a reason at the spots that they're in. How important is it for them to be productive as a grouping day in and day out for the long-term success of the team? Very. Um, regardless if it's sporadic hits here and there, as long as they're being able to be confident with themselves in those spots that we've put them, I think we're going to have a great season. Um, I know that Z is our leadoff hitter with Brooke Pegram behind her. She's one of our best punters on the team. She's able to move Z over in that situation. I know Z is not the fastest, but she is definitely aggressive and sees plays produce, and she's able to take those extra bases. And we also put Sloan McPeak in that three hole. A lot of people don't want to face her, and, and especially with runners in scoring position, but she is a, an extremely, extremely knowledgeable hitter. If she's going to turn down the pitch or if she's able to just poke it down the right field line to get that single to score somebody from second base, she can see the field and place the ball where she wants. Even against, I know I'm jumping ahead to Columbus State, she dropped one down for a base hit, a bunt. Why? Because the corners are back. They're afraid of her. So she's going to utilize every aspect of the field and her knowledge of the game to advance the team's success, not just hers. We're going to touch on Sloan McPeak a little bit later on in the course of this Brooke McCraw show here. The opening Brooke McCraw show of the 2016 season. Folks, I did want to let you know that the Crusaders are going to be playing twice at home this week. They'll be taking on Tusculum on Wednesday, and then they'll have West Virginia State here on Friday. Folks, we hope that you'll come out to Crusaders Field and watch this club play when they're at home. It's especially important to be at home. When you're at home, you're comfortable. Things usually go extraordinarily well. The opportunity to buy or sell your home, you've really got to put it in the hands of people that you can trust. I suggest to you Moss Realty. Give them a call at 704 865 5555 or log on to their website, mossrealty.com, where you'll understand what it is and more importantly why it is that they do what it is that they do so well. Don't forget folks, Moss Realty can help you turn a home for sale into a home sold. I want to thank them for being a part of the Brooke McCraw Show here in 2016. Now coach, we go into the second matchup and, and all of the momentum you would think is going to be in your favor for the second matchup. You got a convincing 7-1 to one win. Obviously the girls are feeling really good about themselves. Now it's just a matter of finishing off the sweep. The issue is, is that oftentimes getting a second game win, getting a sweep, or in some cases if you were to lose the opener, getting the, getting the series even by splitting the two games is going to come down to, to the next person pitching inside the circle for that game. Now some schools, some coaches want to have that singular pitcher go out and throw both games. That's becoming more and more of the, of the oddity, if you will. Certainly depth of rotation, depth of bullpen is important 
for clubs and you certainly utilize your bullpen and you certainly utilize multiple people in your rotation. How important was it for Laura Williams to really get going in the second game? And what was, from what I understand, her first collegiate start? It was. Um, we were all really excited for her to take the ball in the circle for her first collegiate start. But um, what we went into this game is I pulled her off to the side. She is a tremendous hitter. That girl has power in the box. And she's a threat because she's a left-handed power hitter. Okay. But I, being her first game start, I talked to her and I said, I want you to just focus in the circle. Get your bearings. Get, get everything focused in. Let's get after this win, and then we'll talk about you getting in the box for the future. Okay. And she was bought into this um, idea from the start. So we were excited to get another opportunity. Brittany Ortiz was our DP that hit her, that game for her. So we got an extra body in, a new, sure. a new person in the lineup. So that was exciting for her as well. But ultimately, Laura shut things down. We were so excited. She has the best poker face, I think, in her staff. Okay. She's able to just let things go and um, just kind of get after it. She's a great ball player. Well, now, and, and with this, this game took a very different tenor, if you will, to where you gave up the run in the first inning in the opening game. You got two back in the third, and it still was a one-run ball game until you got to the bottom of the fifth inning where you finally created some separation between yourself and Wingate. In this game, you jumped from the word go on Wingate and didn't let them up. You got two runs in the first inning. You got five in the second inning. How important was it for Laura Williams to have a seven-run cushion going into the third inning that second time around in the order? How much more difficult do you think it would have been for Laura if it would have remained a, a one-run game throughout her entire appearance? I think we would have seen a little bit more stress from her, but ultimately our, our team showed up for her okay. from the get-go. Like you said, when we were able to say go, we went, we didn't stop. Um, I think that showed tremendous respect and our team showed up and wanted to compete for Laura. Um, not taking anything away from any other pitcher that would have been in the circle, but for some reason our team definitely showed up for her opening day and definitely had her back and that was exciting to see and it, it didn't stop. Well now, you make, a, you make a great point about this because Chris Anderson, when we did his show this week, he mentioned something very similar to the way the guys rally around to Harry Ferguson. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask you the question. We talk about getting in, getting your work, focusing on your hitting, focusing on ground balls, the pitchers inside the circle, getting their work in the bullpen and all this stuff but there still has to be that element of camaraderie. There still has to be an element of these girls just simply like playing with each other, and when one is in the game, they respond. How important is it to just flat out like the players that you're with on your club and going out and producing and giving everything that you have for those players that you know are going to respond in kind? Well, we actually, going back to our fall, that's sure. our primary focus is, is not just camaraderie, but it's family. Our, our team atmosphere is, is based on family. You're gonna go, you're gonna stick your necks out for your family, your loved ones, and that's what we preach here at, within our program, is that you gotta love everyone to your left and to your right just as if they were really were your sister. So I think they're able to really build on that throughout the year, um, and then during practice, if our pitchers are done in the bullpens, they come and watch our defense. And we really, really expect our defense in those times to really show them that they're going to dive, that they're going to lay out for a big base hit ball, make that stop. And then for our pitchers in the dugout to cheer them on, to show that respect back to them, that we appreciate your effort, regardless if you make the catch or not, but we like the effort that's, uh, that you're showing on and off the field. So that's best basically described from the start. Well now, Laura Williams ultimately had the big seven run lead and it was a lead that ultimately would, would kind of dwindle away. She gave up a run in, in the fourth, she gave up two in the fifth, and, and obviously at this point with them scoring runs, you did decide to go to your bullpen. Was it one of those things to where you felt like maybe she'd just run out of gas or was it something to where we're in a situation, I think looking at who's coming up, dealing with matchups, 
this is a player that I want to bring into this situation so that they've had that experience, and let's see how they respond. I think that's why we did it. Um, we were ultimately, we had two more games to think about on Saturday as well. We wanted to keep her fresh as much as we could. Sammy didn't throw that many pitches in the first game. Right. So she was um, capable of also throwing on Saturday. So we wanted her to be pulled and then to give the other opportunities for other athletes on the bench. Um, I think Amelia and Peyton went in. And Jenna, I think I'm not too 100 percent sure. Well, in the circle that day, you had Peyton Wilson Peyton come in Wilson. and take care of the sixth, and then Jenna Reisenauer got the seventh. Inning. Okay, so Peyton, we wanted to get her the opportunity just in case we were going to utilize her on Saturday, sure. so it wasn't just a, a scare for her to be thrown in as a freshman as well. Now, certainly, and you've mentioned this to me during our preseason discussion that we had, Jenna Reisenauer is one of these players that has become quite versatile for you and she has really grown leaps and bounds inside the circle. Having a player like Jenna that you can use potentially at the back of the bullpen, possibly even as a closer, how important is that for your club and what it is that you're trying to do knowing that there are times with Laura Williams and, and pitchers like her that she's just going to run out of steam and you need somebody to come in and get a four out save or just deal with the seventh inning so that Laura can get the win, Jenna can pick up the save, and the club just keeps right on clicking. I think it's very important, especially with Jenna's attitude and the way she carries herself. I think that's the best thing that she provides in the circle. Sure. Um, she's not going to mow it down you. She's not. She's not a very fast thrown pitcher, but her ball moves. And she has the confidence that you're not going to beat her. So that's really why we want the ball in her hands in the late part of the game. She's going to do her best regardless of the situation. And also, like I also mentioned earlier in our previous meeting, was that she can hit the crap out of the ball. So we right. have to find a way for her to be in the lineup. And her being a DP, we can always put her DP in at any time on the field to play. So it's a, it's a double whammy for her to be in the lineup. It, it sounds like that you've actually gone out now in, in, this, in this time that you've been the coach here and started recruiting players that have that sort of flexibility, the, the opportunity to you know, do the things at the plate that you need them to do, but at the same time have some versatility, go out and play an infield position, get inside the circle and throw strikes from that spot. At this level, how important is it to have as many versatile players as possible so that you can fill your lineup and have all sorts of maneuverability? I think um, ultimately we definitely like to have the utility players up the middle um, okay. with the catchers, the shortstops, and a center fielder. Just because they typically are the best athlete on the field and they will adjust to any position that we put them. Sure. So if we needed to put Danny um, out in the outfield, which she's played left field last year, she was that versatile of a player. And same with the incoming freshmen that we have. They're generally everyone up the middle we can put anywhere on the field, which is great. Now when we're talking about like our pitchers hitting, I don't necessarily just look for pitchers that can hit. Um, I would rather have a pitcher that doesn't hit. But if, it, if they can hit, I'm not going to turn my nose up and turn away from it. Sure, absolutely. Folks, I did want to let you know that these ladies, day in and day out, put all sorts of work on the field. And sometimes they get dinged up, and that's where Ortho Carolina comes in. Dr. Ron John Maitre does such a fantastic job in his 15th season here at Belmont Abbey College. When a kid does have an injury, does get dinged up a little bit. He does an amazing, amazing job with his staff and the athletic training staff here at Belmont Abbey College of getting them back on the field as fast as possible in a position where they're ready to go back in and compete. We want to thank Ortho Carolina for all that they do. Don't forget, folks, for excellence in orthopedics, there's only one name to remember, Ortho Carolina. You improve. Now, Coach, you, you get the sweep against Wingate and you get right back on an early bus to go to Columbus, Georgia and take on a Cougars club that is really very, very solid. Now, of course, the results of the game didn't necessarily go the way that you want them, wanted them to. 
But the two questions that I wanted to ask, the first one being, how important is it in the early portion of the schedule before you even enter the conference fray to get these early bus rides in, have these long trips to where the kids have to get off the boat bus focused and ready to go so that when game time happens, even though they've been on a bus three, four, five hours, they're able to go take care of business, get back on the bus, and go into their normal routine the rest of the way. I think it's very important, especially when we head to Barton this year. Right. That's a very long trip for us, and um, being able to be focused, like you said, getting off the bus. And it also, it going back to the camaraderie, it teaches them how to be a part of a team sure. and a family, the atmosphere, getting off, getting up early, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, getting on that bus, going to breakfast, being around the same people all day um, definitely teaches you how to be a great teammate, uh, a partnership within everybody. Well, and and you talk about the you talk about that Barton trip. I remember here on the Belmont Abbey Sports Network the trip that I made with the with the softball team to Barton. I got to be honest with you, Coach. That's the first time I'd ever broadcast a game in the snow. Um, it was just one of those freak things to where snow rolled into Barton. On an afternoon, we got there, it was snowing, and it, I don't know if it got over 36 degrees that entire day. It was without question the coldest four hours of broadcasting that I had done at that time. You talk about that trip. You deal with weather issues. You deal with travel issues. You deal with kids that, were, let's be honest, they're 18 to 22 years old. It's got to be incredibly difficult for these kids at times to really focus in 100% knowing that there's a three and a half hour bus ride. And more importantly, after you've played all day, there's a three and a half hour bus ride back. It takes a special kind of athlete to be able to compartmentalize and focus on the things that are, that are put in front of them at that moment. I agree, and we try, especially like, uh, like the Barton trip where it's a three, four hour bus trip, we allow them to sleep and study and do what they need to do, but about 45 minutes before arriving, we kind of get things going. We talk right. about our, our game plan. We always do a devotional before leaving the bus, so we, we kind of get that out, and then they then they know it's game time. Right. It's preparation. They can put their headphones in and listen to the music, whatever the case may be, but they're up and ready to go. Well, and, and now we move forward into what we're going to see here this week. Tusculum comes into town, followed by West Virginia State. I did want to touch briefly in the last couple of minutes that we have here on the Coach McCraw show. Coach, this is a Tusculum club that, club that comes in after four games. They're batting 326 as a club. There's no question they can swing the bats. What sort of challenges does it put in your, in your way to make sure that everybody inside the circle is taking care of their business? The number one primor, uh, primary focus right now is um, health. Sure. And uh, with this weather, I mean, we're out there today and it's going to be lower than 40 degrees. And then we'll be playing tomorrow, hopefully, and it will be in the low low 30s so we'll keep our fingers crossed that we're able to play but ultimately it's it's going to be a team 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 win I'm hoping it's going to be a team win because we're going to have to utilize every single one of our pitching and our staff well and just to mention briefly before we close shop Sloan McPeak you, you knew that after the freshman year she was likely going to come in here even better than last year and, and right now the early returns are that it's exactly that. I mean, Coach, she's putting up video game numbers. Let's just be honest. She's hitting over 600 on the year, two home runs already, 10 runs driven in. She really is the quintessential three-place hitter for this club. What what can we possibly expect from this young lady this season? What where is the sky truly the limit? The sky is. Um, ultimately, it comes up to her. How much does she want this? Um, does she want to win for her team? Does she want all these awards and accolades? I've had this conversation with her, and she's not into the awards and being recognized. She definitely wants to just win and do her best for the team, which I applaud her for. Sure. But she definitely does need to be recognized for certain things that she's doing, like Saturday's games against Columbus. She was the only one that was able to drive in our RBIs. That hats off to her. She's come back. She's ready to. She's hungry. But ultimately, the way that she's going to be able to succeed in the box is if we have people backing her up. If Jenna keeps swinging the bat well, 
if Brittany Ortiz comes in as a strong freshman and is able to also back up Sloan Nick Peak so that they, there's a threat backing up Sloan so there's um, they don't want to necessarily have to walk Sloan to get to somebody weaker. It's we have to depend on the people backing up Sloan to be able to rise to the occasion. Well, Coach, we thank you so much for the time today. We can't wait to see you back out there this week as the, as the Crusaders are at home to Tusculum and West Virginia State this week. Folks, be sure to come out to Crusaders Field to check on these girls. As it could be a very, very interesting year for the Crusaders in 2016. For Coach Brooke McCraw, this is Brian Rushing, and this has been the first installment of the Coach McCraw Show here on the Belmont Abbey Sports Network. We thank you so much for tuning in. We can't wait to see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.